Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Uh, sebelum kita mulakan dengan keynote speaker, ada pengumuman Encik Muhammad Syahril Isahak ada di sini. Muhammad Syahril Isahak tak ada ya? Saya ada semua. Uh, Zaini Johana Johana. Okey, nanti aku ai tak pernah nanti kita bincang. Baik, uh, okay. Assalamualaikum, Assalamualaikum again. Thank you very much uh, for your patience. Yeah, uh, it has been a long day, and the keynote speech was pushed towards the end so that you can focus. Because if we do it in the morning, all of you will not be paying attention because you will be, you know, rehearsing your own presentation. So, so I hope no one is is looking at their presentation anymore. Yeah, you've done the part, and just from now, just to relax and enjoy uh, what's going to be uh, said by our keynote speaker. And we are very fortunate, eh? uh, Prof. Uh, Fatima has flown 19 hours from Marrakesh to arrive here. Eh? Uh, sorry, to arrive at KLA and another three hours. <laughs> yeah, on the way back, on the way back, it's going to be more than two hours. <laughs> well, that's traveling nowadays, yeah. Anyway, uh, just as a very brief uh, formality, uh, I only knew, knew about this uh, Prof. Fatima Sakti, he was Chancellor. Uh, although I prepared this uh, Kino's uh, book, it's, it's, it's written, but it's different when you, you speak to her and she said she's a vice Chancellor. Uh, although vice Chancellor in Malaysia, uh, the connotation is slightly different. Okay? But anyway, she has been vice Chancellor for the past eight years. Right, in Tani Ayat uh, and still uh, is the uh, West Chancellor uh, related to uh, Unity Language and Culture Centre. Yeah. Uh, briefly, uh, she's in charge of uh, research, cooperation, and partnership. That's why she is a dead setter, yeah, lying all over the place. And finally, coming to Malaysia for the first time. Yeah, after I met her, and we were trying to do the conference in Marrakech in 2019 or 2020, yeah, but it was shelved, yeah, and the rest is history, right? And uh, she holds a specialized degree in migration and Mediterranean development and foreign applied language, business, and tech. So, again, a multidisciplinary person, yeah, that's what uh, Prof. Fatima uh, is. And, uh, her interest uh, is actually uh, uh, teaching provision and research to focus on gender issues and relations. Okay, I pick up from the keynote booklet, yeah, just highlighting. And uh, the publications uh, listed in the keynote uh, speaker booklet uh, six volume about her interest. Yeah into what is being involved with, yeah? in particular uh, with migration, female leadership, tourism, women in academia, media, and gender. So ladies and gentlemen, Professor Fatima El Pahad. Thank you, Dr. Yusuf. Yes, please. <laughs> <laughs> Good evening. Uh, I know that uh, I'm staying between you and freedom, <laughs> between you and the barbecue, between you and the uh, uh, and the gala dinner, so I'll try to be brief, uh, concise, and hopefully try to catch your interest by the end of the day. It's nearly seven o'clock. And uh, uh, as Professor Yusuf said, he wanted to grab your interest and attention and leave in the keynote until the end of the day. I don't know if it was a good idea because the keynote speaker <laughs> is exhausted. <laughs> we start. So my name is, is Fatim Zahra Iflahem. Um, I'm professor 
at Qadar Iyad University. I've been there for about uh, 23, four years now. Uh, although, uh, as Professor Yusuf said, I hold, I've held uh, various admin positions. I stick to, uh, I say, I just told him that uh, teaching and research is my DNA, and uh, I like to present myself as a professor researcher before presenting myself as uh, a vice chancellor or anything else. My keynote today will be about uh, something that is at the core of what you've been doing, what we've been doing together this afternoon, but what all of us are doing actually, that's making research, researching, trying to contribute to global research from our own perspective, from the perspective of the global South actually, which I think is a perspective that should be taken into consideration, that is not enough taken into consideration, uh, either in our own, on our own side of the, uh, of the world or uh, also in the global north as it is called. So my keynote is about, a, it's coined a, pers a global south perspective on post pandemic science, technology and innovation. There are here a couple of keywords, global south, it's all of us. Uh, of course, so it's our perspective, it's my perspective and ours I'm trying to, to ponder, I'm trying to share and I'm trying to uh, present to your consideration. Science and technology, science, technology and innovation have, are very important to the world and they have never been as important as they are today. We are in a post-crisis context and of course, science, research, innovation are core, are very interesting. Uh, very quickly, I'd like to touch upon a few key uh, ideas, others will be um, within the presentation, <clears throat> sorry. But I'd like to share with you, uh, I'm not going to say anything new, all this you know already, but I'm going to share, I'd like us to share and, and stop and consider how the pandemic has actually revealed, re-revealed, if it was necessary to re-reveal it, the importance of innovation, the importance of technology, the importance of science, and the importance of research. I'd like also to weigh the science policy paradigm. Where is science from? At what distance is it from general policies? But also, the, I, would, I would say the pandemic also revealed politics and science conflict and politics hegemony over science. The politicization of science or the scientificization of politics? Question mark. We'll look at that. Uh, also, I would like to advocate for the need for global science, global south produced knowledge. And of course, collaboration, coordination, and the soft power that uh, uh, science can be in our countries. Right, so trivia, everybody knows this. We have learned lessons from the past as per science throughout the last century, precisely, but uh, ever since humanity is humanity, science and technology have fueled knowledge, have fueled global development, have fueled progress, and also hope, hopes, postponed hopes or, or, or realizations or achievements of these hopes, but hopes for a better tomorrow, for better worlds, for the people that we are all. Innovations also improve the livelihoods of humanity, of people, ordinary people, although of course some are still lagging behind. Science and technology, therefore, science, technology, innovation, theoretically should help ensure resilient post-COVID post -COVID contest, contest. So ensure equitable recoveries. It should also theoretically uh, hope for sustainable development and sustainable uh, futures. All right. Many upsides to science. There are many uh, of, uh, good 
fight and upfight to up, up science. Science and tech have proven their capacity to create global responses to crises. First, the pandemic, the COVID pandemic, is not the first crisis in the history of humanity. There, there have been many before, and there will be many after this one. And science and tech uh, have always been here to find solutions and to address challenges, climate change, pandemics, etc., etc. But for the first time, I guess, in the history of humanity, there is, we are in front of a huge deal. Imagine, this is today history, and it seems like something that we take for granted, but humanity has been able to discover a vaccine in less than six months for a pandemic that was totally unknown, that was totally unprecedented, and that was on a global scale. It's not Ebola, and it, we're not uh, concerned with it. It's not AIDS, and it's too far from us. It's coronavirus, it's everywhere, it's uh, in every house, on every continent, and it has locked us down for months. So it's important. It's a huge deal. So science has actually been highlighted in the role of science in times of COVID-19 as a science booster. Everywhere in the world, there was a huge mobilization of science, of research, of research systems during the pandemic. And of course, there was an acceleration in the trends that were already underway. People were researching a certain number of illnesses and, and things, etc. But there was an acceleration of research and research capacity also. So publications by hundreds, 75,000 published COVID-19 scientific papers. More than 70% of these papers were open access. That's unimaginable. It's wonderful. It's great. Billions of dollars were poured into better understanding of the virus and developing vaccines. There were unprecedented levels of international cooperation, although, of course, there, were, there was competition, but people had to cooperate to create and find something. Several vaccines were actually approved, and campaigns were, are, are still underway. Of course, we still have people who refuse to be vaccine, vaccinated, but at least uh, a huge proportion of human beings is now vaccinated. Some people have one dose, two doses, three doses, and others even have a fourth dose. And we are speaking of recall doses that people will have to take. And most people are playing the game and, 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 you, and using vaccines. So this is a real intense response to COVID-19 that is mobilized. And what is important in all this, in, in this context of pandemic and uh, uh, drama and trauma, scientists have been and still are at the forefront of the debate with the public, and they are at the forefront also with the, with the uh, debate with decision makers, and they are, well, let's say, not everywhere, but at least they are uh, looked upon in, in, with consideration and with respect. Everybody knows this guy, okay? He has been the face of science for actually two or three years, okay? So scientists came to the forefront of uh, people, uh, of public opinion, public debate, and public, uh, uh, the public sphere, right? You all know about this. You know, uh, of course, for uh, crises and for science to be science, and for crisis management, there is a process that you all know. There is the preparedness to crisis management. There is the response to the crisis management. And then there is the recovery and feedback. And this is what's going on at the moment with the COVID uh, crisis. So that's what's going on. All right. Wonderful. COVID-19. COVID-19 has many teachings. 
there are many teachings for us to take from this uh, worldwide crisis. And uh, the teachings are many in, uh, as opportunities. We have huge opportunities. Uh, it was a crisis, but it, was, it came also with, with possibilities and opportunities, many of them. The pandemic demonstrated the power of science, of technology, and innovation for the global well-being of global populations. The pandemic showed the efficiency of science. Even while the thrust of science and scientists is peaking, was peaking and is still, uh, does still exist today, people refused vaccines, others uh, spoke of uh, conspiracy theories and uh, uh, talked about the objectives of the vaccines that were supposed to be to alienate us and to transform us into zombies, and, and George Orwell's 1984 was there, and uh, et cetera, et cetera. And also, the COVID pandemic revealed advances of science that were crucial to recover better from this crisis than from others. And the COVID-19 pandemic uh, highlighted something important. It is the need to keep the momentum. It's the, the need to Never stop, okay? Researching, advancing, finding new things, etc. So, of course, science and technology revealed themselves crucial to address other global challenges, not only this uh, crisis, but also equitable pandemic recovery, of course, but the global growth, sustainable development goals, etc. People have never spoken as much of sustainable development goals as they are speaking of equity, access, education, equality, etc., climate change, etc., etc. Ah, all right. Of course, there are opportunities, but uh, these opportunities are they breakthroughs or are they are there some backlashes still? Well, it's up to you, but let's look at this. Of course, you have the breakthroughs, but while you have the breakthroughs on the left, each and every uh, achievement has another predicament uh, linked to it. Science championed vaccine development. Good, great. But uh, the uptake of public health evidence reflects disagreements. There are disagreements on this. Technology and distance education, that was a revolution. Uh, technology revolutionized distance education. We were all teaching a little bit online and teaching distance, etc. but we were forced to, all of us were forced to shift very quickly to the digital teaching and, and people learned, everybody learned and tried to do it, teachers and professors and students and, and families, etc., etc. But again, million school dropouts, million young people not being able to go to school of the world, million people not being able to follow because they, they could not have, they did not have laptops, they did not have the technology, they didn't have connection, etc., etc. So many leftovers and people were left over. ICTs reduced distances, of course, but it also augmented new types of illiteracy. You are educated, but you're illiterate if you don't know how to use uh, information and technology uh, 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 tools and means. And it happens to many of us. We have to grapple with, oh, how do you do, how do you do this? How do you do that? Yes. There were, of course, extraordinary movements of solidarity uh, between people, between ordinary people that we all are. We help people with packs and we and we we we, we sat down and we breached the lockdown to take uh, uh, food to uh, people who did not have food or, or, or things like this, okay? So huge solidarity in the world, everywhere at the same time, huge and increasing competitions and conflicts between states, look at what's happening in Ukraine and Russia today. This is probably something that, uh, that was born during the pandemic and that is now revealed to the rest of the world. Many other conflicts. There were tremendous, incredible 
growing benefits to, uh, to people, individuals, but also to businesses and companies. It, it, it is said that, that benefits have not been as big for certain companies as they are today. While more populations, more and more populations were dropped into poverty, vulnerability, sometimes extreme poverty. So you see all these discrepancies uh, that, that this uh, opportunity revealed, but at the same time there was a backlash on it. But major thing, I think that the most important thing that, is, that I consider key is the failure of the international system, is the failure of the United Nations, the failure of the international organizations to deal with the, with the unsuspected challenges. We had the head of WHO coming uh, to, uh, uh, the, the, on TV and saying, whatever, we, we couldn't grasp anything, but we, everybody realized that the international system was just as inefficient as the states and just as inefficient as the people that we are in the ordinary citizens and that there was no coordination between the states. So the international system proved its inefficiency in managing this crisis. And countries and states have to grapple with what they have, actually. The pandemic and the inadequate responses, all, of course, also uh, further the divide between the north, the global north, and the global south. Between a global north that is entrepreneurial, that is uh, rich, that, uh, well, the haves and the have-nots. And then the others, people who could not have access to vaccines in sub-Saharan Africa, for example, in other countries that, have to, that could not have access to specific vaccines, uh, that could not have access to education, etc., etc. And, of course, besides all this, besides this backlash, there were other more dangerous threats. Of course, there were the hazards on healthcare systems. Healthcare systems everywhere. Think of Italy. I was talking to Professor Yusuf uh, a few moments ago. Think to what happened to Italy, a developed country. But Italy took COVID at the face. It was the, the losses, the human losses in Italy were just incredible. Germany. Countries, the United States, countries that are considered to be rich, powerful, developed, just were uh, felt hopeless and speechless in front of the COVID. Stakes on quality and sometimes access to education. There was no quality education. We, we carried on a research, of course, there was uh, a distance education, but we realized that in our university, which is considered one of the best universities in the nation, Actually, we provided success, but did we provide quality? Big doubt. We don't know. Slashes and cuts in job opportunities and professional progress of the people. People have to stop working, especially women. Many women have to stop working to go back home. Okay? And we make in social practices. Uh, many people celebrate work, distance work, and working from home, etc. But this is very alienating. Imagine you take your job, you take your profession to your house. Imagine you are a woman, you have children, you have a husband, you have your own work, and you take your work with you home and you have all this to do at home. This is crazy. And people are celebrating. Of course, it's wonderful that people, have, people are able to work from home and, and people are it's flexi work, etc. But but always look at the other side of the coin. What does it entail for the individuals that we are, for our private lives, for uh, for our pay? Have we seen our pay augmented because we're working more for the uh, available hours that we give our employers? Because there is no divide between our private between our private lives and our professional lives. And of course. There has been an unprecedented divide between classes, generations, uh, countries, etc., etc. 
Exclu exclusive forms of literacy. If you're not digitalized, you're not literate. <laughs> right? Hegemonic science. Pfizer is better than Sinopharm. That's hegemony. That's imperialism. If you are, my daughter is going to travel next week to Europe for her studies. She has had Sinopharm. She will not be able to go without having a test. Why? Because Sinopharm is Chinese, and the Chinese are not good at making science. That's imperialism. That's neo-colonialism. Digital coloniality. Uh, the use of digit of a certain specific digital learning and digital uh, use of the digital world, okay? Uh, which is not the other use that, that other people in the other parts of the world can have it. And of course, radical cultural discourse. Remember the first weeks and the first months of the crisis. The Americans said that the, the virus came from China, the Chinese said that it came from Russia, the Russians said that it came from Italy, the Italians said that it came from Morocco, the Moroccans said that it came from Algeria, and, 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 and. Okay? So radical discourses and hate discourses based on uh, excluding the other and excluding the different and the foreigner and the foreign. But I think that above and beyond all these catastrophes, there have been variable perceptions of science in public and political response to, pande to the pandemic. And these sometimes have interfered with the best use of available knowledge. Of course, we were all warned during the pandemic we were given advice that scientific, uh, no, scientific evidence related to COVID is conditional and dynamic, that it was changing, and that uh, uh, in times of doubt, we should be cautious. And uh, although we had news from the WHO, we needed to take that with precautions because, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So, that increased doubts even in organizations, in scientists, etc. But remember the power of word of mouth on the crisis? Look at this. This is the coronavirus misinformation topics. Corresponding number of articles in the media. Look. How many articles on miracle cures? You remember the take bleach, and you will be cured from. <laughs> and who said that? My gosh! <laughs> All right. Then of course, uh, anti-Semitic anti -Semitic conspiracies, uh, etc. Pandemic, etc., etc. So we were forced to understand, of course, that public opinion was taken revenge from science and forcing itself at the doors of knowledge, especially in terms of social media, the power of the social media, where opinion, everybody today has an opinion on everything. Everybody knows and everybody can give their opinion on Facebook about everything, about cancer, about COVID, about uh, HIV, about this and about that. And that's really dangerous. So of course, this created disagreement with facts with concepts, with concepts that are back in academic research. And every single person at the bus stop could contest <laughs> facts, scientific facts. And there was huge criticism of experts and expertise. And there was hijacking of science, I would say. And there was hijacking of science by politicians. That's why, what I call the politicization of science. Okay? And how the politicization of science, of course, is not new. 
people have always used science, I mean states, authorities, the brute power of state has always used science for its own uh, benefit. It's not new. But the COVID-19 exacerbated this use of knowledge and use of science, conspiracy, conspiracy theories, incredible theories about what the COVID is, of course. Thousands of people today refusing to take vaccines, of course. And also, not only because of positions against the vaccine, but sometimes as a defiance against the state, okay? I'm not taking the vaccine and I'm free not to be vaccinated. It happened in France, it happened in Germany, it happened in Italy, it happened in everywhere. There were demonstrators saying, we're not going to take the vaccine. And this is a stand. This is an anti-state stand that we're making here. And of course, politicians making use of science, of course, manipulating scientific evidence, of course, and using it for their own benefit. Ha, ha, ha. Remember this? He was talking about the flu season. He said that the flu season was coming up, and that met, every year many people uh, just get the flu and die of, of the flu and this and that. Why should we close down the country? Why should we stop uh, living normally, etc.? We, we should learn to live with the COVID until he got the COVID itself. <laughs> and until thousands of people died in the United States and elsewhere. In Brazil, remember, the president of Brazil, in, in the midst and height of, of, of the pandemic, he was traveling uh, across the country and meeting people, etc., and saying that COVID did not exist. And it was in, an invention of the West. Of course, also, social media users and views on helpfulness of posts about COVID-19. And look how they look at them, okay? How in the United States, how people found this useful. Posts from public officials, from new organiza news organizations, from family members, etc., etc. So it's dangerous. It's really dangerous when People who are supposed to be holding science and defending science call their people to drink bleach to be cured from COVID. Of course, he tweeted that and he was cut from Twitter. All right? Because he violated the, all the codes, all the codes of reason. All right, so how can we achieve this science policy balance? Of course, science can achieve breakthroughs, but science alone cannot solve complex problems like peace and poverty. And science should serve the improvement of people's lives. That's what science is meant for. But again, there is a need for lots of things. There is a need for a common understanding and common incentive of what is science, what is research, what is targeted research. That's not something that is still uh, today acquired and validated in the world. We research, but what type of research? We research for uh, bombs, we research for lots of things, but how much is research used for sustainable development and for global challenges, global challenges. The explorations of science and technology and their new uses, we need to go and invest into open science, into open source technology, into digital public goods and public commons. And of course, we need to reimagine a common ground and new ways towards the uh, a new political and economic order so that science is not used for the benefit of some, but for the benefit of all. And of course, we, we need to rethink our policies towards 
society, and the planet needs. So there are lessons yet to be learned. Some were learned, but many are yet to be learned. If we want to transform the lives of those living in poverty and help achieve the development goal, if we want to fight climate change, if we want equal opportunity for all, well, the positive outcomes should rely on social programs with underlying technology in them, and not technology that is superposed to uh, programs. If we want to endure, and if we want enduring post-pandemic technologies, then we need to evaluate and adjust our programs for inclusive, non-discriminatory, transparent, explicable, and accountable social programs and research programs and knowledge in general. There is science out there. There is knowledge out there. And science should be used as a weapon, not a mass destruction weapon, but as a soft power weapon. Science can be a soft power weapon. Actually, capacity building research needs to be conducted to address a variety of situations in different countries, and it is already done. I told Professor Yusuf a couple of days ago, I, I feel that at least in Malaysia it is done. Much of the uh, human sciences research that is carried out in Morocco is still very much, pretty much theoretical, and very little of it is addressed to the needs and, and problems of the people here and there. This is what science should be directed towards. A scaling up of proven and emerging technologies should happen to address the locally driven and context specific issues. And there should be motivation and incentive for sustainable development research. Democratizing science is also an important tool for to use science as a power. That, that, that means that citizens, citizen science initiatives should be taken into consideration. They should be able to contribute to open and, and to open accessible data and increase accountability to stakeholders. The OECD said recently that no country, society, or economy can face the pandemic alone or any other global crisis, and that's true. The OECD is quite never right, but in this, it was right. All right? And of course, the, there is this idea of united, of being united in science to, of course, study sea level rise that is provoking huge catastrophes in some areas of the world, climate change, can our consumption patterns, our global, global fossil use, etc., etc. Well then, what role do we have in all this as Global South countries? Which role can we play in this? During the pandemic, a wonderful thing is that science came from everywhere. It also came from the Global South. And when I looked at the conference, this conference article topics, it proves, if need be, that there is need for useful, meaningful, human-centered science in the Global South, and that there is this type of science in the Global South. Today and yesterday, you discussed public health, mental health, education, flexi work, business, food security, ICT, millennium strengths, backbone pain. <laughs> Today, traditional and cultural ties and trends, etc. These are, this is useful science. This is science that answers the needs, the immediate needs 
of the local populations and that answers immediate uh, uh, challenges and immediate problems. And this science exists all over in the global south. This is a list of what topics were uh, in this conference during these two days. So this power of the science and what are the uh, future lessons? What are lessons for the future? There are things that we have and there are things that we need to cater for and to home for. We have substantial knowledge. There is knowledge, okay? There is no harm. There are resources. There are good wills. They are developed and supported before the crisis, the crisis, but they are here and they are available and we can build upon them and we can pull up on them. We can put them together and develop them. There is sustainable resilience and it is warranted by a wide range of knowledge and capacity in the global south. What we need is the, the, the pandemic scope and implication and, and its implications and its magnitude. It's like a tsunami, okay? And this tsunami is calling for unprecedented efforts for public and specialized science. We need general science, theory, etc., but very specific science also. And this science, this type of science that is both very general and very specific, can only be found in collaborative work, can only be found across, and, and can only be produced across nations, across disciplines, and across experiences and human experiences. And because, also this is one of my very important uh, advocacy uh, uh, questions and issues, the importance of human and social sciences because of their collaborative, transdisciplinary, participative nature, I think that research in the social sciences and humanities should be uh, encouraged because it can foster justice, it can foster equity, it can foster uh, equal opportunity, inclusiveness, and it can foster resilience to crises. Everything I've heard this afternoon goes for what I'm saying here. Resilience will come from, resilience to COVID and other crises will come from the social and human sciences. How do uh, nurses, do are nurses resilient or not? Okay, what do the elderly do in this situation and that? How do the millennials uh, react to uh, lockdown, etc., etc. This cannot come in physics and chemistry and else, elsewhere. Of course, these are important sciences, but the human and social sciences have a lot to bring. The three C's, collaboration, coordination, and complementarity. The, po the pandemic context allows unprecedented opportunities for collaboration for coordination, for com complementarity in the global south, but also worldwide. But we need to review our policies, including the funding for science and technology. We need to decide which science we want and which to fund, okay? And we need to fund science that is meaningful and useful. We need to centralize research on pandemics and climate change and other uh, global challenges. We need to strengthen and adequately fund international collaborations. We need to achieve more equitable and inclusive global digital societies. We need to contribute global solutions for global issues and problems. And all this is already done in the global south. And because it is done, it legitimizes the global south. It legitimizes the global south as a producer of science, not only within doors, but with the north, with the global north peers, as a community of expertise. And we should fight for this to happen more and more. We should advocate for global, for, for global south science to be recognized in the global north 
it to be catered for and to be uh, considered. But it also legitimizes the Global South researchers within doors. And because of that, it, it sh we should involve stakeholders from the Global South as co-researchers, co-creators, and co-designers of technology for the Global South, but also for the world. Yes, we can. They also can, these people from the Global South, these experts, these researchers. Science and technology, science and innovation to combat the COVID crisis is important, okay? There are, of course, in the long-term investments in R&D and innovation will be essential to, uh, to promote a certain number of, uh, or, or to address a certain number of challenges. But a more urgent thing, I guess, is the recognition of Global South academia and knowledge by their own public opinions. We heard about Fauci's, and we heard about others, but our own scientists were not heard, their voices were not heard at the international level. They were not invited, and God knows that we have scientists that contributed to research. And from time to time, a local paper wrote about a Moroccan working in the United States that is in the team of Fauci to find vaccines. But in Morocco, we did not give them voice to speak and to help and to contribute. And of course, we need to establish and reinforce the authority of Global South experts with the national politicians with their, with inside their countries, with the states. And we should work so that this, the power of the scientists is more important than the power of the state in turn when we speak of science and when we speak of research and expertise. I'd like you to take away something as saying by uh, Antonio Gutierrez, the United Nations Secretary General. Talking about the COVID-19, he said that these advances in science, in post-COVID research, hold promises for collective challenges beyond the COVID crisis. And he listed a few, climate disruption, inequalities, etc. But he stressed that it is essential to work together, collaboration, across borders, coordination, sectors and disciplines, and to make science and technology work for everyone complementarity, the three C's perspective. Not to conclude, because this is a topic that cannot be concluded, it's not yet the past, we're still into, uh, in, way into it. Responses to the COVID-19 should be massive, diverse, and differently effective. There is not one response to the COVID crisis, crisis and to the crises that will be coming next. Strong, urgent, disruptive, but common responses are needed, okay? We need to have common responses between the Global South, the Global North, and the Global South if challenges yet to come are to be addressed. And of course, founders, politicians, experts, international organizations, all of us are in great need of to define the actions, to state the priorities, to find the mechanisms to boost science and outcomes of science by and for all. Thank you very much for your attention.
it has been some of you, and uh, I'm sure there'll be about 10 papers on by the start of my talk tomorrow morning. Again, thank you very much, uh, for Fatima. We are very, very late. We have to start the time uh, for the dinner. Just uh, in case there is, I allow you one question. If someone wishes to raise it for us, I just allow for one question. You can uh, continue this theory for dinner. Yeah? But if anyone who has one very answer that, you know, a uh, question, no? No? Yes? No? Yes? I told you I'm still between the dinner. <laughs> <laughs> so they, they prefer the option of over dinner. Yeah. Right, okay. Thanks again. Another round of applause. Go ahead, Amanda. Thank you very much. Uh, there will be late, but I think uh, we can make it. So we found the formula for the conference. So we made it strict, we made it cool, and, and I think it's less hassle and you know, this, this is many people, you know, delays on it. Right, so, see you at uh, dinner time, right? Uh, by 8, yeah? Okay. Salam alaikum wa Bye-bye. Thank you, bro.